Okay, well, I'm going to start off um, with this no information, no information available. This is an index card from Lucy Lippard's um, exhibition in Seattle and Vancouver, which were named by the population numbers of the cities at the time. And no information available is a card that was produced by the American conceptual artist Christine Kozlov. Um, and it was a response to the notion of what is information and information and the idea of documentation and what is documentation. So a sort of play of ambiguity going on here. Now, in the course of what I'm going to be speaking about, there is a lot of play of ambiguity around the idea of what is documentation, how do we remember, how do we recall what might, we might not be able to recall, that we recall through others forms of documentation, through others' conversations, through their notations, obviously through photographs, and so on. Um, at the same time of this exhibition, a few years before, there was a book published by a man called Robert Ash, which is called Information Theory. Information Theory was a very popular uh, uh, presentation of new forms of information, uh, availability, distribution, networks, and so on. Um, different systems of information networks. Robert Ash's book became a kind of byword for a group of artists in, at the beginning of the 60s, through the 60s. In fact, um, the French artist Bernard Venet uh, made his whole exhibition at the New York Cultural Centre in 1971, his first solo exhibition, pasting up copies, photocopies, large photocopies of information theory. So no information available, I thought, was a nice way to kick off this uh, talk today. One of my uh, ways in to thinking about this is through artists' exchanges. Artists' exchanges that are implicit or explicit through the work or to be found in conversations or in archives or in other kinds of uh, information sources. And I start off with this uh, slide, uh, this photo, um, which was actually taken by Barry Fanneke um, at his exhibition in Museum House Land, the um, Mieslander Row building uh, in, in Germany, in Krefeld. And this was his first museum solo exhibition in 1969. And he made a lot of the work on site. He was there for three weeks. And he explained to the director, Paul Wember, that he wouldn't be able to bring over all the materials. And Wilma said, it's fine, just make stuff wherever it suits you. So he made, did what became a sort of established practice, which is making work on site. Some of the stuff he did bring over. And you see his presence in this double exposed negative. And I like to think of the double exposed negative as a way of haunting what we're doing. So our presence being present in the archive the artist's presence being present in the archive, and this sort of ongoing potential for an exchange that takes us forward into the future. Now, this is a rather interesting uh, occasion. A long time ago, when I was looking through the uh, magazine Studio International, I'm going back to when I was a fine arts student, so we're talking really, really a very long time ago, um, I saw this ad advert of uh, Barry Flanagan um, in October 1970. It's beside the contents page. There's actually no reference to it in the contents page. There is just the, uh, the, the work that's on the left-hand side. And it says um, that for a fee of £2.25 MP, which is new pence, uh, if you send this back, Barry Flanagan will um, send you an obliterated version of the, of the print. Uh, as a work in itself. Now, when I met Barry um, a number of years later, I asked him whether anyone had actually responded to this and whether anyone had actually taken him up on his offer. He was pretty astonished because he didn't think anyone would remember it. And he said, no, no one took me up on the offer. Anyway, uh, I thought that was a bit of a strange and rather sad situation. Um, here we have the um, actual marked up copy that was used for printing uh, from, the, from the archive, from the magazine archive, which actually 
was returned to, to Barry Flanagan by the editor, Peter Townsend. And then on the right-hand side, you see one of the prints with the blacked-out text. Now, um, being extremely excited about this, I made every occasion possible to show the print. But I think it's rather an important one, because it tells us all kinds of things about the nature of practice and the, and the nature of playfulness in practice. Um, I put it in an exhibition in Leeds, which was focused around Barry Flanagan's light pieces. And David Ward, who you will hear later today, is an artist who knew Barry Flanagan very well and worked with him on a number of occasions, taking photos of his work. <laughs> now, at this uh, exhibition, we have a new transformation with the David Ward work being represented in the Barry Flanagan work. So a sort of coalescence of new possibility, which is occasioned by, by the situation and the context of the work. This install shot is taken uh, in Cullen and Richard's space, the artist collaborative between um, uh, Charlotte Cullen and Janine Richards. Um, a few years ago, in the uh, beginning of 2015, when um, I was working on an exhibition called Five Issues of Studio International, which was going to be at Braden Road. And one of the key works I wanted to include in that show was a work that had been shown in the magazine, which is Barry Flanagan's One Ton Corner Piece. When I say the work had been shown in the magazine, I mean documentation of the work was shown in the magazine. Um, the work had not been shown since 19. Uh, 68, it was shown on two occasions, once in Paris and once in London. Um, and so because it was a kind of key work to show in this exhibition, I thought it was rather important to do a tryout. Uh, because when I was sort of gamefully, you know, planning the, the, the exhibition, I was thinking, oh yeah, it'd be fine, it'd be easy enough to organise a ton of sound and put it in place. And then as it got closer to the time of the show opening, I, I started thinking, well actually this is pretty pretty important to find out how to do it. And I had had a number of conversations with Flanagan about the nature of resituating work. What were the parameters involved in this resituation process? What were his uh, guidelines? What did he feel about it? Was he in fact okay with the idea of one ton sound piece being uh, reinstituted, being situated in a new place? And he said, yes, use your discretion and show it where it's appropriate. Um, and so I, I contacted these artists, um, Janine and, and Charlotte, um, who I know have an artist from space where they occasionally do very interesting, I think very interesting shows. And they, they were completely up for the idea. So we managed to um, organise it, and with the help of um, Ashley Mottram, we carried in this ton of sand. And I can tell you it's very hard work. <coughs> Um, a ton of sand for someone who doesn't normally carry tons of sand. It's pretty heavy. And so it did actually take about four hours. And the process of carrying the sand and creating the work was like a form of following a choreographed uh, pro uh, performance. Because the sand, the nature of throwing the sand and the nature of positioning the sand is a little bit similar to the act of painting. But it's like the act of painting under a certain type of instruction. Uh, so anyway, so that, that was the realisation of, of those pieces. And then the um, heap, which was the work that was in front of the, of the one ton sand piece, um, requires two people to fill the bags with sand. The sand is a different type of sand from the sand that's used for the one ton. Um, and on a number of occasions, Flanagan was dismayed when he went to different countries that there were as this type of sound that he was familiar with from the UK or from another place like, say, for instance, Germany, was different in the US. And so he had to sort of like rethink about the properties of the sound and how that would shape the work and shape the situation. So when um, Flanagan was, was um, actually selling a work, which is the work that probably everybody's familiar with, the four blue canvas sandbags that stand a little bit taller than than me, that are in the collection of the Tate, the negotiations with the Tate Gallery, as it was then, and 
his commercial gallery, the Rowan Gallery, was such that they were very concerned about the storage of the sand, whether they would need to get sand newly on every occasion, whether they could use existing sand, and how long it would take to install. And Flanagan said that he had issued instructions for his gallerists, who were um, Alex Gregory Hood and, and Gregory Hood's assistant, <coughs> assistant who was known as Wonky Kingsmill, and that it took those two, Wonky, who was a, a, a very slight, um, small woman, it took those two working together four hours to install that work. So I would say four hours is a pretty accurate um, description of how long it takes to install all these works. The fact that it's a collaborative thing is, tells us something about the nature of instigation of the work, how the work actually makes itself. The materials give themselves properties. The materials themselves have properties that kind of direct the shape of what happens and the shape of the whole process resulting in the final installation of the work. Now, light pieces for Flanagan were quite different from um, the sand pieces which the sand pieces, the description of how to install them, was more of a sort of inferred oral situation. So conversation through, through discussion and through a sensibility. With regard to the lights, the instructions are quite specific. So I spoke with, with Flanagan about these differences. And I think it's very important to note that at the time that he was making the work, he was keeping these records. Which, which document the first installation of the work, the name of the work, and the specifications of the work. Now here, here is the um, archive, one of the archive, the Trina archives, from the exhibition uh, The Hair is Metaphor in um, Paul Kasman Gallery in New York in earlier, this, earlier last year. It was it opened in April. And what uh, I had two large vitrines, and I wanted to show the kind of the presence and the trace of presence of Flanagan's practice in the US, uh, which began in, in the mid 60s, actually in 1965, in a group exhibition circulating from MoMA, um, but with the documentation from various different shows where uh, Flanagan was first interacting with artists like uh, Sol Witt, uh, Rosemary Castoro. Um, Jean Beery, uh, Christine Kozlov, Joseph Kasuth, and so on. Um, and so you see, you see at the top um, one of Seth Siegelau's exhibition as publication books, uh, which is the March 1969, when uh, 31 artists were asked to design a work per for each day of the month, uh, which was circulated as as a publication. And then down at the bottom, you see the. Um, Lucy Lippard index cards, which is where the information, no theory, came from that I, that I began, out, began with. Lippard asked artists to either send instructions for the realisation of work that they were unable to realise, or to send documentation of previously existing work. So she had a whole range of differences, like you might be able to see the um, instructions sent by Solowit, uh, which I'll come to later. And again, on the right-hand side, you see um, the the card uh, of <coughs> Flanagan produced for um, the realisation of, of a particular work. Uh, you see install of sculptures in public places. Uh, you see a, a studio photo. Um, and you see centrally what is pat Pataphysics, which was a, a, an evergreen publication given to Barry Flanagan in 1963 by poet friends of his and became uh, a constant companion of uh, both, both the book but also the notion of pataphysics. And on the, at the top, on the right hand side, there are uh, stamps that were designed by a number of people for pataphysics, uh, for the uh, collage de pataphysique in Paris. Um, and Barry was asked if he would, if he would allow his hair to um, be used as a symbol for a stamp of pataphysics. Um, and Flanagan didn't actually receive this letter. He was sent a letter which went missing. Um, and eventually the letter caught up with him, or perhaps it was a repetition of the letter rather than the original letter. And he said, yeah, of course, of course, you can, you can use a, a hair stamp, but I'm going to do a new one. 
And so he did this sort of anthropomorphic shape of a frog hair, so that it's, it's like an a amphibian mammal um, morphosizing into, into a new form. And he was told at this time that the hair, a uh, symbol of the hair for the pataphysicians, is a mark of approval that they've paid their dues, their, their, rent, their, their money, for the Ecole de Pataphysique membership on time. So if they receive the mark of the hair, they're, they're good people, basically. So of course, Flanagan was very happy about this notion, so associated with the hair as a uh, quixotic uh, creature. So a detail of the letter you can see there from the Collage de Pataphysique. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because the, the, he had, Flanagan had no idea about this, uh, the symbol of the hair for pataphysicians. I mean, of course, he had he was steeped in the folklore and mythological connections with the hair, but not at all these other peripheral things. And these are the sort of peripheral things that surface through conversation, through investigation, through sort through unexpected, serendipitous um, situations. So. The hair is metaphor. Um, I should think for sacrifice in the face of peace. <coughs> um, this, uh, this is the installation of the um, uh, daylight light piece four in Paul Kesman Gallery, but I'm afraid it doesn't look very good because it looks a bit black. It's actually the canvas is blue, um, and it's because we were very bright in here. And I wanted to really to show a different situation. This is from the Leeds installation, which is the artist run space, into a into a commercial gallery. And I think you know the kind of shift of context is something very impossible to, to, to bear in mind and to think about how that might change the nature of the work. Does it change the nature of the work? And this is looking in the other direction, and where you see the install of a piece which is called Sand Pour on the left-hand side, which was shown for the first time in Leeds um, in 2017. Um, I should say it was for the second time, because the first time that it was shown was in Barry Fenneman's studio in 1968 when he made it, um, and he hadn't exhibited it uh, since that occasion. And you can see the uh, photos of a hole in the sea, which were photos that Flanagan took when Gary Shum's Land Art films, for which he made the film A Hole in the Sea, were screened on German TV. And Flanagan took these photos from the screening and then made these prints from that process. So here we have a closer view of a few of the <coughs> slides of Lucy Lippard's slides. And I'd like to draw partic particular attention to um, the, the connection between these different artists associated here in this, in this group um, selected by Lippard. So a large number, um, 70, 70, over 70 artists, from the US, from the, from the UK, from parts of Europe, um, from uh, a couple from South America, uh, were invited to submit work for these two exhibitions. Most of them were unable to go. A few did, but mostly they couldn't. So Lippard and her assistants had to uh, work to realise the work um, that they were sent the instructions for. And you see this work of Jean Beery. Note make a painting of a note as a painting. Uh, and the title of that is a logo, logoscape, or um, acrylic 5x5 five five between the eyes art, and then the date of when he actually made it. We should come to this in a minute, I'll come back to that. Um, these two works of um, Sol LeWitt, where the second one you see is obviously the one that was in Vancouver, and the reason that LeWitt decided to make a second work for Vancouver was because his instructions for Seattle were not realised properly. And when he saw photos that, that Lucy Lippard sent, uh, he said, this is completely not acceptable, I'm going to send you a new piece. 
Um, and I should say that I dis discovered that through a variety of different sources. <laughs> Combination between Lippard's archive, uh, Sol Lewitt's archive, um, and one of Lewitt's um, uh, assistants. <coughs> So here we have um, a bunch of different uh, installations from, um, from the Seattle installation, which were then added to the Vancouver um, uh, exhibition. So new cards were added, which showed some of the installs of the um, Seattle. So you have, <coughs> so you have the uh, two, uh, three space rope sculpture of Flanagan uh, in, in, in the space there. You'd have Ava Hesse's work uh, uh, leaning up against the wall, um, and then uh, that w very strange install photo that's been shifted onto its side, on, on the other side. Okay, I said I'd mentioned something about Jean Beery, um, this idea of note, make a painting of a note as a painting. Now, Beery is an artist who's really slipped off the radar. He was present in all of these shows, um, and his uh, work caught my attention. Um, but very little has been shown uh, since then, other than recently there's been a flurry of interest. And I'm very pleased to say that he's going to be having an exhibition in Fry Art in Freiburg um, uh, later, later this year, in April. Um, and here we have uh, Rosemary Castoro's work from Paula Cooper Gallery. Um, that was th these are the only install photos that exist from that exhibition of her work in that exhibition, number seven, which was organised by Lucy Lippard, and then she sent that documentation for Seattle and then recreated a, um, a piece around, around that, which was shown in Seattle. Um, now, I'm going to come, come to an end with a few um, works of, of uh, Sol Witt. Um, and this is a stamp, as you can see, by Thomas Eakins. Um, it's of the uh, Bilgin uh, brothers, and you see the Bilgin brothers rowing, um, and it, was, it came out in 1967, and Solowit um, would buy stamps when they came out, and in some cases make a work of them. He did it with Eakins, made two <coughs> copies, and he did it with a uh, Mirandi um, print, and he did it on a couple of other occasions. Um, but he and Flanagan spent quite a lot of time together in New York and also when they were showing in Tokyo. Um, and he would stay with uh, Flanagan sometimes if he came through London. And on one occasion he presented Flanagan with this, these brothers rowing, the Bilkin brothers. I thought it was a nice way of demonstrating discussion and exchange. Um, I thought I would end with... Um, a couple of um, images of a couple of slides taken from Solowitz's book Autobiography. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with autobiography. Um, Solowitz took photos of, of everything that was in his Hester Street loft, <coughs> including the fittings and fixtures, including the things in the cupboard, including the bookcases, including um, uh, contact sheets and uh, posters, exhibition invitations, books, and so on. Uh, you can see at the top, for example, on the right-hand side, the work uh, on the first row uh, um, on the left, um, the po Barry Flanagan's poster from his exhibition at the Serpentine Gallery uh, in 1980. Um, and you can see uh, works by Sol Lewitt. You can see printed matter on the left-hand side collection of different things. And then here you have another series uh, of sequence taken from the autobiography book um, and I wanted to include this one because of the sort of juxtaposition between uh, Jean Beery's The Joke Book, which is not a book, it's a work, of a, it's a work rather than a book, it's a, it's a book can be a work of course, but this is, this is a, a card, a painted card. Um, and then you also have Lucy Lippard's I See You Me and other artists' books, which I, won't, I don't have time to talk about now. And then I'm going to end with the work of um, Jean Beery's 
which is in Sol Lewitt's collection. And I'm going to end with a, a very, very short story about that, why I have that. So I mentioned that Jean Beery's work has um, become uh, unknown, although it was very well known um, during the 60s. Um, he had an exhibition in 1963 in New York at the Iolas Gallery. And after this exhibition, I should say he was very young. He was probably 25. After this exhibition, he left New York. He lived in Hester Street in the same building where Sol Lewitt had his studio. He, in fact, told Sol Lewitt about the loft. They were both working at Mama. Um, Beery was a guard, uh, along with Dan Flavin, an elevator op operator. And Sol Lewitt worked in the bookshop and uh, was also a night guard. And uh, they had a long discussion and conversation. Anyway, he told him about this space. Beery left. He couldn't, couldn't deal with it, all whatever reasons they were that he didn't want to stay in New York after this exhibition. He left his work in the loft, and the, uh, the landlord was about to clear it all. And Solowit discovered that it was there and took it. And the reason why we have it, this work, is because Solowit took it. I'd like to end on that note. I think I might have a few minutes time for questions. Um, I think we could call yeah, a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Anyone like to? <coughs> Any questions? Hi. Do you wait for the microphone? Um, tell us a little bit about um, how you actually come across the material, because um, everything you look at the material, some of it is, is better known than others. And what's your process for actually discovering those materials? Uh, yeah, 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 that's a, that's sort of very kind of um, a very good, very important question. There are so many different sources. Um, sometimes material is readily available in archives. Um, in public institutions, and it could be like an exhibition archive, it could be a, a, a spe specific individual's archive. Um, sometimes it comes, information comes through conversational discussion. Um, for example, Jean Beery's work, which is a case in point, I was aware of because of the index card that he had in the Lucy Lippard th um, cards. Um, I was also aware of his friendship with Sol DeWitt, through discussions with Sol Lewitt. but so these are these are things that happen through like exchange of conversation. Um, I found his name in a number of different articles um, written by different people, literally as a name check, and also showing was. Um, so so it was like that. So it's very different. All things they come through different sources. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that 